All right, hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero. Sure, we could complete game live on stream. I will be trying to put into practice some things we read yesterday. I was pretty interested. Um, one of the things I try to do on Handmade Hero is we obviously always try things ourselves. But a lot of times when I'm actually programming, I'll read a lot of papers. And it's kind of hard on Handmade Hero because reading papers isn't really something you can do on stream very well. I mean, I guess we could all sit here in silence while we all read the paper. So it's a little bit tough. But what it does mean is that it, it kind of robs us a little bit of one of the main tools that I would normally have when we're actually working. Uh, which is the ability to go gather information from lots of people who've worked on stuff. Now... We happened to luck out um, on the stream yesterday in that we tended to have we, we we ended up stumbling upon a few things that we kind of wanted to know in a way that was quick and easy for us to actually read on stream. We could go through it. Uh, they happened to be written in very uh, convenient form, like you know, it wasn't a huge pile of math equations that I then had to kind of like work out. It was actually like a very well written uh, paper on the subject we cared about. And it was really easy for us to to digest and process. But anyway, point being, I was really into the octahedral encoding idea. Uh, that, and it was very easy to sort of quickly see what they were doing and present it on stream as well. Uh, and so today I want to go ahead and try putting that in so we can kind of move a little bit closer to finishing up this lighting. Because lighting is really the biggest stumbling point we have right now. We, we really just haven't been able to quite make it click. And I feel like the octahedral encoding part of things would really help us out because the, the biggest problem we have right now is we don't really know how to store these things uh, and update them. And it seems pretty easy to use this as a way of doing that. Now, I do still think it's a little bit of an open question as to whether or not we want to use a texture array or a texture atlas. One of the things we figured out on yesterday's stream was that there's actually an inversion that happens such that you cannot actually uh, use a wrapped sampling mode when you are interpolating your vectors for these, uh, you know, for the octahedral encoding. And that's just because, you know, there's no way to actually wrap the coordinates correctly. But what I don't know is, I still don't know why you wouldn't use a texture array, because even though it means you can't do proper wrapped sampling, it still seems like you would want to clamp to edge, right? And for some reason, they didn't do that. And I don't know why. And again, one of the big problems with this is I uh, respect the authors of this paper, and I think they're very good. So if they didn't do it, it probably means you don't do it. Meaning, like, they wouldn't have chosen an inferior scheme. Um, and, and so that part's still a little bit iffy to me. And just to give you some, um, which paper would it be? Is it this one? Yeah. Um, I don't think they would have chosen an inferior scheme. Now, maybe they would have for some other reason. Like, it could be that there is some reason they chose this scheme that has nothing to do uh, with its efficacy. Uh, maybe they wanted to be able to display the maps in a certain way uh, or something like this. But if we look at how they supposedly actually shipped this thing... They pack all of their stuff, and you can see it here, they pack all of their stuff into little squares in a texture atlas. And what that means is when they're sampling them, they will at the very least have to have a little border edge that they would use uh, in order to make that sampling work. Now, here's what I'm thinking, and I don't actually know if it's true. But my assumption is the reason that they would have done that, if we assume that they chose it on purpose and not arbitrarily, which I think is the safer assumption here based on who the authors are, I'm wondering if maybe part of their scheme actually goes back through after they... So if they're using like an 8x8 eight eight here, like they said, they do say they leave a gutter region. And what I'm wondering is maybe they have a pass that goes back through uh, once they've computed all their 8x8s eight and actually fills in a gutter with fetches from the other side of the texture so that they actually get proper interpolative sampling. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that I think that's probably why. I don't know if they say that outright. They didn't seem to immediately in the paper, but I'm thinking that the reason you might need to do that is when you're computing the lighting on something, if you didn't have that, as you went around the seam, 
you would presumably see a lighting pop, right? So I'm kind of thinking that if they're using bilinear filtering when they look up in here, uh, I'm kind of thinking that that is what they've done. So I'm thinking they may have wanted to use an atlas because at that point, there's no reason to use a texture array. I mean, it doesn't do anything for you. So you're just wasting extra coordinates. There's nothing, you know, it can't, it can't help you at that point. So my assumption, and I don't know if it's true, but my assumption is that's what's going on here, that primarily what they're doing is they're going to take an 8x8 eight eight or whatever the resolution they chose, uh, because I think they said it was 8x8 eight eight for the lighting, but you know you, could, you put whatever you want, 4x4, four 8x8, four, eight eight, whatever. I'm suspecting they took the 8x8, eight they added a one pixel border around the whole thing, which they kind of said they did. And then before they go to actually use it, they probably replicate the correct part of the, the, um, uh, that the octahedron where its neighbor would have actually been the correct neighbor. They probably move those pixels over so that you get a seamless sampling. I would assume that's probably what they do. Uh, but I guess I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess I don't know. Um, so you can see right now they say like one pixel texture gutter border ensures correct by linear interpolation and additional padding aligns probes on four by four right boundaries. So we know that they do sort of some of the stuff that I'm talking about. We just don't know what they put in the padding, right? So let's take a quick look. Uh, just to see what's up. Uh, you can see here that they say like, okay, we're gonna trace a bunch of probes here, uh, which is fine. We don't really care about that part because we're doing that a little bit differently anyway, but you know, we're gonna do something like that. Uh, here's where they actually figure out what the uh, illumination is, is gonna be. It doesn't really matter again for us. And they say, then they go through and the texels in the octahedron, uh, unwrapped octahedron, they do the blending and they figure out what the result should be and that's fine. And then what I want to know is, is there a set after this, right? Um, that kind of like fixes things at all. And trying to look here and see again, it's hard to read papers on stream, but just to see if there's anything like, uh, I'm not seeing anything yet. Um, like I, I don't see any where they really say specifically, but um, So here they're talking about how they're storing it in terms of individual light, like the, in terms of the actual value format. Um, but I don't actually see, I don't actually see them really talking about this one way or the other. So I don't know. Um, that part, I think, is just a little bit of a question mark. And I guess what I would say is, you know, what we do have to go on here, where we look at uh, the actual lighting data that we see, which would be like here, right? Um, looking at this lighting data more closely is, is really all we've got to go on. And if we look, you can kind of see that at the very least, uh, w what I'm saying, d I guess I, I would say doesn't seem to quite hold water with what I, what you see here. And the reason I say that is because if you look at these two pieces, they don't match. So if you actually were copying, um, the border in some way that 
that replicated one side over to the other side, you would expect to see this line and this line roughly match up. And they don't look like they do uh, in any real sense, right? Like it doesn't look like, unless, yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that's the seam between two of them because it should be smooth everywhere to a certain extent. Um, and I just, I, I don't see that as being the same as that flipped around at all. I could be wrong, but it just, it really doesn't look convincing. And so I really don't know what to make of that. Um, but you see where my dilemma is, right? So again, really don't know what the goal was there or what they were doing. And so I think we're going to have to kind of play that part by ear. And we do know that they've, they've given us some source code to work with. We've got the supplement here. And, you know, so we have a little bit uh, of data. And uh, if we open back up again what we're looking at here, um, we, we can look at, like, their C file. But, I, again, I don't really know... Uh, that we're going to be able to determine exactly what they're doing here because this is not complete source code, I don't think. It's it's just a, you know, sort of a vague sketch. It's like part of the source code or whatever. And, you know, looking at the actual process, I don't know is going to tell us that unless there's an obvious smoking gun like fill gutters with the thing or something like that. Uh, and, you know, I, don't, I, I doubt that that's, you know, living in here. Uh, so, you know, looking through it... Uh, update a radiance probes, you know, here's that code happening. Um, so here is a blend pass on these, it looks like. Uh, that's probably doing some of the final stuff. I'm not sure what shader this is using. Um, a radiance field copy probe edges uh -huh. they did not include that one unfortunately so I guess what I would say is that is maybe the smoking gun I was looking for so if you call something copy probe edges you are at least doing something as far as you know trying to do that pad so I guess that tells me most of what I need to know. While I don't know exactly how they're copying the probe edges, because that particular pixel shader does not appear to have been included, um, so I guess I don't know. What I will say is that I do then kind of know that they're doing a copy of the probe edges, so I will also probably want to do a copy of the probe edges, and it's just a question of how to copy. And since I know they're doing a copy, I guess I don't need to clone their copy. I kind of know what I probably want to put in there. So that's really all I needed to know. That takes at least the mystery out of it. They are doing roughly what I was guessing I would want to do. And that gives me some confidence that I understand what they were doing. And I'm not missing a crucial part of the process. So that satisfies me. I'm, I'm pretty happy now. I think I know all the steps I would want in this process. And I've got at least rudimentary confirmation from the code they published with the paper that they're doing something that would at least be in line with what I'm thinking. And again, we don't know for sure exactly what it is, but we don't really need to know exactly what it is because we can figure it out ourselves uh, what we want to put there. And it might be different from what they did anyway. It might be that our uh, usage is different. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and start figuring out how we would actually make this work. And I think what I want to do first is I'm going to want to have some method that I can use to just compute these things and display them without using them for lighting because it's going to take us a little while to get this working and I don't want to try to infer from the lighting in the game whether it's working. I want to be able to directly see it and I don't want to have to run my thing under like, you know, render dock or something and like grab a, a periodic thing. I want to be able to like see it in real time as we're walking around the game 
And so what I would like to do is make something that will render, like let's say um, we just add a pass at the end of the rendering where every voxel grid square in our or, uh, cube in our world will show it's floating in that space what it thinks the octahedral unwrapping for the space was, right? Um, so that I can get some idea of what's going on in each individual uh, space in the game. So it's a little bit hard to do. It'll take a little bit of work to like write a thing that's going to actually do that manually. Uh, but it's not really a huge deal, right? It's just a bunch of little like quads that would be camera facing that pick out the exact region of the thing. And so I'll tackle that in two steps. The first one is getting that texture atlas set up. And the second one, uh, well, actually we'll do three steps. Get the texture atlas set up and, and outputting some data into it. Two will be drawing the texture atlas itself down like in the corner or something so we can just see it. And then third will be uh, placing those individual uh, octahedral unwrapped quads into the world where they actually occur so that we can try to correlate them and see that they're actually producing something that makes sense at the points where they are nominally existing, right? All right, so if we go ahead and build, oops, uh, and we go, let's sit here, uh, and we get the game running. Uh, just make sure everything's kosher here. Yeah, everything seems good there. Uh, so if we go ahead and make sure that we have somewhere that this is going to actually be stored, uh, what I want to do is start probably in the OpenGL layer. Uh, not that. That. Uh, and in here, we look at what we're currently sending down, right? And these are the buffers that we actually store. So you can see we've got light data N and light data C. We've got uh, these handles and stuff for the textures and, and whatnot. And the thing that we're going to have to reckon with here is that at this point now, we're really not going to be sending down the data in this format probably anymore is my guess. Um, we could but we would just need a tremendous number of these because we want to use octa we want to lose little textures. So we're going to have something slightly different happening here. We're going to have a light atlas uh, handle. And this is going to be a texture that just has all of those little 2D unwrapped um, octahedral unwrappings just strewn throughout it, right? And in our case, since we know that we're always going to be doing light probes on a grid, right? We're always going to be doing a voxel of them. We really don't need any more information than that. If we look at something like this, what we're going to see here is is essentially um, useless data. We don't need to know any information about our voxels anymore because just the voxel information itself, like what what the index would be. So the three coordinates that tell you which voxel uh, cube you were in, just that information will itself be enough to unwrap into the light atlas to look up your lighting. So I don't think we're actually going to need uh, that information, right? Now, it's worth noting that at least in this paper, they did something a little bit fancier than what we have done so far. And you can see, we didn't talk about this, but you can see, you might wonder what's this stuff down here? Like why are there, why is there extra information? And the answer is because we've been talking entirely about, you know, in here, we've been talking entirely about what the color of the light, what the irradiance was for a given probe. So, you know, we're talking about what's the light value we're gonna need uh, coming in here. And, 
what you have to remember is when we construct the lighting from these light probes, we're going to be asking from a particular location in the world, we're going to be asking, hey, what light would be contributed from this light probe or something, right? But we're asking for a location that is not where the light probe actually exists. And so what happens there is if we actually have some features in between the light probes, so basically like we have a light probe uh, in two, like, you know, this light probe and this light probe, so two neighboring light probes, and we're asking, right, like what's the lighting here? Well, the answer is going to be a combination of these two light probes only if there isn't like a wall in the way, right? So one of the questions we might want to ask ourselves is from this light probe to the point we're actually looking at, could we have actually seen that light probe? And that seems like it's going to require another raycast, right? But it turns out that when we've done all this work beforehand, if we just store the depth that we tend to see in that direction, like how far the light probe goes before it hits something in that direction, that would tell us whether in general we tend to be able to get far enough out to encompass the point we're actually sampling, right? And so all they do is just like, look, let's just store an additional sample here that's the depth that we went so that we have that information in addition. Right, And that seems like a really good idea because if we do that, then we don't really have to worry anymore, right? Like we can just say, all right, we're already, we already know that information because we had to do the raycast and the raycast output how far we went to get the color value. So at that point, it just seems like pretty easy for us to keep that information and we can improve our sampling of the light probes with it. So I'm going to go ahead and say, while we're doing this path, let's just do that. And we don't have to use that. Um, so maybe we'll call this like light color atlas handle and light depth atlas handle so that we can, we can have both of those. And in the future, we will start to make use of this. Whereas at first we can probably just ignore it because it's yet another thing that could go wrong, but we might as well just remember, okay, we're going to be outputting that. So let's do it while we do all the rest of this stuff. And we don't have to debug it at the same time, but we can at least make sure that the whole data flow is working uh, and we don't have to come back and do it. So if we want to do that, then we're basically saying, look, we're just going to submit two things here, right? And rather than light data and light data C, we just have to have these things uh, in, uh, captured for us. And the main thing that we're going to have to know here uh, is what the size of our voxel is, because for each voxel, we're going to have one of those. So if we take a look at this light lookup voxel dimension, uh, we know we're going to have that cubed, right? Uh, and I might just go ahead and say that since we know that these will be roughly similar, I guess we don't actually know that. Um, yeah. So in order to provide the data for these, for the light color data, and the light depth data, uh, we know that each of these are going to store precisely as many entries, effectively, uh, as there are voxel cells, which is going to be the cube of whatever our dimension is. But then we also know that we need some size for each of them. So we need a secondary parameter here that's going to be like similar to light uh, lookup voxel dim, right? So in, in addition to this, we're also going to need one more thing, which is the light uh, lookup, you know, square dim or something. And we're going to have two of these probably because we don't know that we're going to store the depth and the color at the same resolution. And there's really no reason to unify that resolution. Um, we could, but it doesn't really save us anything. Like it may save us... You know, I, I can't think of anything that saves us. So we, it's free for us to define two different constants. That's whatever that square dim is. So the light lookup square dim 
uh, is going to be something else. And maybe that's like eight or whatever, right? And we probably, again, need the padding. So it'd be something like this. Like it'd be an eight by eight, but with plus two padding or something like that. Um, and we might want to define the padding or I don't know how, I don't know how we're going to want to specify this, but it'd be something like that, right? And we can break this up into multiple defiance later. What that means is we're going to have something like this. And if we want two different ones, one for the color, one for the depth, uh, it would be like this. Um, and this now it's kind of hard to read that and you know we might want to do this right where you can pass something in and it just says that so we just say all right if I want to cube something I can just use a macro for that. And if I want to square something, I can use a macro for that. Because then it's like, well, it's the square of this times the cube of that. And that's just easier for someone to come along and read, right? So I feel like that's probably useful. Um, I mean, it just, it just makes it easier to read and edit these things. And without that, it's kind of a little bit ridiculous how how it, long it gets there. So then you can say, all right, it's the square of this times the cube of that, and then we know what we're actually dealing with here. I'll leave these the same at the moment, um, and we'll just kind of put light color and light depth in here, but we'll split those out and play around with those a little bit more later. Uh, I might move this into the math side of things. Uh, oh, all right, we already had that. So, <laughs> I guess we just weren't using it because we forgot we had it. Uh, typical of, of what we do here, but, you know. One of the downsides of only program something once a week. All right. So, if we look at what we're doing here, we now have the ability to send these down. We don't need this. We don't need this. Uh, and so now we've just got one texture atlas that'll store, store all the color data for our lighting, and one that will store all the depth data for our lighting. I think that's all we actually will need. Um, these, again, are not submitted to the shaders. These are just submitted to the lighting system. So they need to stay here, but they don't actually have anything to do with uh, the texture submission. So we're going to need to fill these out once a frame, and we're going to need to submit them using, the, uh, using these handles. But once we do that, we've pretty much got the pipeline ready for us. And we just have to go start working on actually getting the values out, right? Um, furthermore, I think, um, trying to think here, but I believe if you set these both to white, like we probably could make something that allows us to turn off the lighting without actually turning it off, meaning that just subbed in things here that just say you're getting uniform lighting from everywhere, right? Uh, so we'll see about that as well at some point. Anyway, uh, okay. So let's go ahead and start making that work. We're gonna have to start by changing when we actually create these things. So if you look here, when we actually gen these textures, we're actually just generating one texture now instead of uh, a bunch of them. Uh, we're just generating one texture for each of these. So we've got the light color atlas handle. Uh, and then we've got the light uh, depth atlas handle. That's what we need there. Uh, we don't actually need to do a for I loop here anymore. This is just going to be sort of your basic, uh, it, it doesn't need to do any loops. It's just your basic assignment. And so if we just take these, the first thing we want to do is create a light color atlas handle. It is not a 2D texture, a 3D texture anymore anyway. It's a, a 2D one. And what I'm going to do is at first, uh, you know, I guess I don't really know. Um, 
if we can afford it, I th on this suit, because this is a high-end card, I assume we could afford it. What I would like to do is have everything be float first. Um, I, I like as much as possible to be able to get quantization crap out of the process so that I can eliminate those kinds of bugs uh, by knowing they don't exist until I'm done with the other parts of the algorithm. And then I can turn to a quantized format and deal with bugs that show up because it, it segregates the bugs into two different kinds of bug so that you don't have to tackle them both at the same time. Now, the problem is this is going to be pretty big. So if it's a 32... Um, oops, I promised I would never use that again. Uh, where's my speed calc? Where's my speed, where's my speed calc? Oh, crap. Didn't we have this all set up? Um, yeah. Yeah. Ah. There. That took way too long. All right. Uh, so if we assume that this thing is going to be like 32, at least 32 cubed times, um, what were we saying? 10. So it was 10 squared. Uh, so that's not huge. You know, each one of those is going to be uh, at that point 16 wide though so it's a 52 megabyte texture so but that's fine like for testing purposes right how bad does it get if we get one more down ouch so yeah like if we were to go to 64 by 64 by 64 which we may well want to for resolution quality um at that point, like, it's pretty dicey, and you would definitely want it to be that. So, but even so, it would probably just run slowly. Like, making a half gigabyte texture on this card will still work. It's just not something we want to do much, right? Um, so it's fine. So, so I'm going to say, sure. Like, this will work. Hopefully, it just might be slow and crappy, uh, but it will work, right? Although, now that I think about it, how the heck are we going to submit this thing? Yeah, that that is scarier, isn't it? Because one of the things that I guess we didn't count on when we thought about this was most of this would probably have to now be done on the graphics card. Like, if we just think about what we're doing here, it doesn't seem particularly possible that we would be able to, um, we wouldn't be able to prepare these textures and send them down. You're not going to be submitting that much data per frame and never, it's never going to happen. Uh, so I guess what I would say is we can start off with this, but we're pretty much going to have to, we're going to have to use, um, a 32 by 32 by 32, pretty much we can't try a more resolute version unless we move it to the card. I mean, that's what this tells us, right? So we can proceed currently doing it on the CPU side this way, but if we wanted to move to a higher resolution, we'd have to throw it onto the graphics card. There's no other way to do it, right? Um, and that has nothing to do with the computation time. It's literally just the amount of data traffic that would be involved is prohibitive. We could... We could investigate ways of sending down other stuff, but yeah, I, so so I think basically what we have to do here is we'll get it working this way, and then if we want to do a more resolute version, we're going to have to throw it on the grass card, which we may not need to do. I don't know. The This resolution may be fine, and if it is, then we can stick with our current method because 32 cubed times 10 squared 
times four is only 13 megabytes. And that is not a troubling number for sending down to the card every frame. So that would be our target for release shipping. If we can do that, we're probably good. We could also change the resolution in Z because that's probably less important since we, we don't need to see as many levels of the game uh, necessarily. Uh, although I kind of like the fact that we can see down deeper. So, but anyway, uh, let's, let's just go ahead and say this is what we're going to do for now. And we'll cross that bridge when we come to, if we want to kick it up to 64 by 64 by 64, we'd have to go to the graphics card at that point, but either way. Um, so at that point we know that, look, we've got light lookup voxel dim, uh, times light color lookup square dim. That's our dimension. Uh, so it's just that. And uh, this can all stay the same. Uh, we're only going to need to send down an RGB float at the moment. Uh, we don't need to send down anything else, so that'll just be fine. Uh, in the future, we'll have to think about how we're actually going to store them, and that'll kind of be a issue for another day. Now, the depth will be easier. We don't have to care about the depth nearly as much, and the reason for that is just because the depth is just one value. So it doesn't multiply out by four uh, like it was before. Oh, actually, did I forget to do that? No, I didn't. I, I remember that. So actually, this version is the largest it could possibly be rather than the smallest it could possibly be. And it could get as low as times one, uh, at which point even the resolute version is probably not too bad, right? Yeah. So even the really high res version would still be untroubling because it doesn't have to get multiplied by four. Uh, so it's really not that bad by comparison to the other version, which is quite bad uh, because it's 100 megabytes of traffic instead of 26 megabytes. And those are pretty different. Um, so anyway, all seems fine. Uh, I don't really want this as a format. Uh, in fact, I really just want one color for the depth handle. And when I bind this out, I'm going to want a 2D texture again. Um, I'm going to want it to be a R32F, so just one. Uh, I'm going to want it to be the same dimensions as before, but the only difference is we're going to use a slightly different constant so that we can control the size of these two things separately, even though we don't actually know that we ever actually want that. There's really no reason not to do it because they're always going to be separate code paths, I think, for the most part, uh, that can just use a different constant in that place. So it shouldn't be a huge deal for us to fix that part. So uh, off we go. That just looks fine. Um, I guess I don't remember exactly what happens in GL Texture 2D though in terms of parameters. I should look uh, because I don't know if this extra parameter is there. So, you know, I'm just going to real quick pop over to docs.gl and take a look at what GL Texture two, uh, Text Image 2D actually takes because uh, it's always just this big string of parameters. So I want to make sure we've got it right. So target, check, level, check, internal format, check, width and height, check, border, check, format, type data. So I think we've got that uh, correct. Like that looks, that looks fine. So this is all we really needed to do. I think that pretty much gets us what we want. And the only difference here is since we're storing floats at the moment, I'm just going to say, all right, at the moment, instead of U32s, these are going to be like V3s and F32s. Because, again, I just want to start out in float so that we don't have to worry about quantization uh, until we get everything else working. It just keeps... It's something complicated like lighting. I'm just trying to manage the complexity a little bit because it's always bad and you don't want to give yourself even more to worry about. Uh, that's probably not actually a, a dynamic call there. That's probably uh, just built in. Yeah. Uh, all right. So what is the problem here? Term does not evaluate. To, oh, yeah. I forgot the comma. All right, 
So now all we need to do is in the light direction count here uh, loop that we were doing before, this is not going to happen. So when we fill out these commands, uh, the game render commands, we just need to pass only these two things that we actually needed. So here where we have light voxel C and light voxel N, uh, that's actually going to be changed and it's going to be light voxel C and light voxel D. Oops. And these two here, I guess we don't really need to do that. We can just have this be a pointer in each case. And this is a, a, a V3 and that's an F32. Um, so these are, you know, not going to be labeled anymore. Done with that. Uh, so these are going to have the information we actually need here. And I think we're good to go from there. What I would like to do is get rid of the for loop because we don't need that anymore and then these should be uh, C and D and they should point to light color data light depth date oops depth data and they no longer have multiple indices just one of each all right so now that we've got that out of the way, uh, the binding textures here, again, no longer necessary to actually have a for loop because we're only going to bind one of them. Uh, we don't need to do text subimage because it's actually just, uh, uh, sorry, we don't need to do text subimage 2D because it's 3D, it's actually 2D. Uh, and similarly, all of those can go by the wayside. So we have a light color atlas handle and a light depth atlas handle. And in here where we actually specify like the offset, we're only going to need two offsets, not three. So we've got the level and the X and Y. We then have the size of the thing that we're going to be doing here. And again, that's going to be the voxel dim uh, times the light color lookup square. And then we're going to need to do the same thing for these. So again, just sending down those two. Uh, however, wait, you know what? This is not quite right. I just realized something. These still need to be unpacked. So actually, we do need a uh, place to store the cube version. So one of our dimensions, and I guess I don't know which one, actually needs to be bigger than that, right? So, hmm, I, I guess I don't know that we, that we need this thing to be square for any particular reason, because we're not mip mapping it or anything. Yeah, so I guess I don't know that this needs to be square for any particular reason. Um, although it may be better to do so. I mean, it may still be nice to have powers of two for it, but I guess that's a separate thing. Um, but point being, one of these dimensions has to be larger, right? And I don't know which one we want to do. Uh, because if you imagine, right, we've got sheets that are light lookup voxel dim by light looks like lookup voxel dim number of octahedral unwrappings, but then we have another voxel dims worth of each of those because it's three dimensional, right? So one of our dimensions has to have that in there, right? Like we have to have like the X be longer or the Y be longer. I don't know which one we probably want. I'll, I'll say let's double the X for now, right? So basically our X has the equivalent of the whole thing in it uh, and you know, the Y, like the Y is actually going to be the Z at this point, right? Um, so I, I didn't really think that through. That that was not what we wanted to do there. Sorry about that. Um, let me think about that for a second. Yeah, I think that would be fine. Um, I think that'll just work.
So we need to, when we actually create them, we need to fix that then. And so where we actually do the text, uh, the original text image 2D, we need to make sure that we actually do it that way. The problem with that there is I'm not really sure, again, like, I'm not sure how to really encode that. It seems like it's fine the way it is. Uh, let me just uh, go back here and change that. So if we double this voxel dim here on the X, I guess for now we'll just remember that's the case. But it would be nice to make that a little bit more systemic. Um, it's just it's a little wonky, right? But all right. So suppose we do that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make this be... C and this be D, and then we can run it. All right. So that's what we're looking at, or trying to look at here. Oops, I don't know why that's a 3D. That's what we're looking at, and now we just need to actually get rid of our compiler errors. Obviously, that's a built-in, again, just like it was before. Um... I don't remember what this was called. Light color data? Yeah. And light depth data. At that point, I think we have created the textures and we've bound the textures, but we don't ever accept the textures. Okay, here we go with that, right? So, uh... oh wait, no, never mind. So here we submit the textures. We just haven't ever used the textures. So now we need to actually use the textures, which happens in here. Uh, so we're going to have the light data C, or light color data, uh, and the light depth data. We don't need this index anymore. And we've only got it just the one time. Uh, and so in here, we don't really need this anymore. It's just three, two, and three, right? There's nothing particularly fancy happening there. Um... And I think that's it. So now in the actual shader, we will have to pull from these a little bit differently, right? Um, in this particular case, these are texture 2Ds now. This also is a handle. And I think we just want to go to the shader now, right? So this is us actually filling this stuff out in the actual lighting code, which we do want to go address, but that's sort of step two. So before we do that, we should go to the compile Z bias program, which is the thing that actually needs to take this information. And when it actually does, um, you can see here, you got all this stuff. None of that is actually what we want anymore. So now we want a light color sampler and a light depth sampler. And there's only going to be just those two. So we're not going to do any more of those, right? So that's the entirety of it. And I don't think anyone else cared about this, right? It's just this shader is the only one that actually samples the lighting, I think. Uh, and so now these are going to be uniform samplers that look like this. Uh, and we've got a color sampler and a depth sampler. When we actually go to sample them, uh, like in, you know, this stuff here is now kind of all wrong. Uh, we're going to have to rewrite all of this stuff because this is all doing totally different stuff than we were doing before. And so we're going to have to do a mm, completely different way of sampling because now we're going to actually be using octahedral samples and we're going to be getting eight of them and actually like, you know, pulling from those eight and blending together. All right, so I want to say that all, like literally all of this, unfortunately, is now kind of just not right. 
And so I kind of think we can just maybe not use, we can just delete it, really. Uh, we know that this is roughly correct, but everything past there is, like, we're not going to be using any voxel lookups anymore. And so I think we can just say, all right, look, that is going to happen, and this stuff is going to happen uh, totally differently. So we can probably just not do this. I mean, it's just not really going to help. I'll leave it in for now. Um but I'm mostly just going to not use it. So let's go ahead and say, all right, there's just an if zero here. That's going to be taken out of the equation. Oops, literally. Um, inside the sum light call, what we'll do is we'll just return a white light for now. And we'll just leave it at that. So it doesn't matter what you send down. It's never going to get looked at. It's just going to be no lighting. All right. Uh, and, oops, uh, here where we actually send down lighting from the voxel cells, again, uh, this is going to totally change. So we should probably just not bother doing much with this stuff anyway. Um, in fact, I think I'm just going to delete this because it's completely useless. So off that goes as well. All right. So now let's just get things working at all. So let's take a look at our OpenGL errors. You can see here we're getting a, an error message from OpenGL. Let's see what it says. Of course, we can't because the debug info won't tell us. Um, I feel like we sh should be able to see that at least because it's a parameter. Yeah. Uh, GL invalid enum. So I don't know where this is happening, but presumably, yeah. I was going to say, presumably, we just missed a texture 3D. So the <sighs> I hate absolutely hate the way OpenGL does that. It, they fixed it all, but of course, trying to be in OpenGL 3 means you can't really use it. Uh, instead of just saying what the handle is, you always say what the target is, which means every time you change what kind of texture, you got to change all the enums related to that texture, which just, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it, it's a nonsense way to do things. I don't know why they did it that way, but um, point being, we need to make sure that we, in fact, really shouldn't have a texture 3D anywhere anymore, I don't think. So, like, all of these should all be text 2D, I think. And this doesn't need to be here anymore for obvious reasons, because it's not actually 3D, so there's no wrapping that can happen in R. Right. Um, so let's take a look and see if there's any other texture 3Ds anywhere, because we know they're probably wrong. Uh, yeah, so I think we can just for now get rid of those. We don't have any Vox lookups we need to do, so let's just get rid of those. All right. Um, oops, let's rerun that uh, and see if we can get to some other error. And texture type and format combinations invalid. All right, so let's take a look. Uh, who is asking for this? So this it did not like. Oh, uh, I think because that's not the, I think it's GL underscore red. And I think those are actually different. I guess I'm not sure. I guess I'm not really sure. But uh, let's try and find out. I think that's right. Uh, 
exception thrown, but it doesn't say who has thrown the exception. Who has thrown this exception? Somebody has thrown an exception, but we cannot see a call stack. I don't know why. Oh, because we threw an exception on the ret. Really? That seems bad. How can we not get What would involve a jump of that nature? That seems a little bit weird. Um, I wonder where that is. Let's see if we can step through and just so we can find out like roughly where we're crashing. So we initialize OK. So we must be getting a problem when we actually go to render something. Let's see if we make it to end frame. Let's put it that way. So we do make it to the end of the frame. Let's see what happens if we step into the frame submission, which would be here. Could be that we screwed up like this, for example, right? Oh, in fact, that is screwed up. Yeah, and that's what it is. Um, not sure why it couldn't tell us that. I guess because since we were giving it memory that we didn't own, it must have just overwritten something somehow, I guess. I'm not really sure why it would have because we're not writing to memory here that we don't own. We're asking it to fetch memory it doesn't own, which should have just faulted on the read. But that doesn't look like what actually happened. So I guess I don't know why that occurred exactly, but apparently it did. So off we go. Um, so that should be right here. And that's the problems that we told it three components, which is not what we're actually submitting, right? We're actually submitting one component. Um, so it was reading three times as much data because we said, here's the dimensions. And then we said, well, there's three per element, but there isn't. Uh, and obviously that's not in the mix. So here's the renderer running sans lighting. So there's no lighting being uh, used, but in theory, the lighting textures exist and are being submitted now. And so the first thing I would say is let's do exactly what we did last time. Let's try to output standard spherical lighting into the octahedrons. That will take at least the rest of the day today, if not into next weekend. And that will be our goal. So then we can output spherical lighting from one light source into the octahedrons unencode them in light with that result in the actual renderer, and we can display those textures. So that's a ton of work to do. Uh, and if we actually get that done, we've put ourselves, once that's done, we've put ourselves in very good position for finishing up, right? Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, the first thing we would need to do is implement the octahedral wrap and unwrap. So I'm gonna go ahead into uh, math land here, and I'm just gonna have an octahedral wrap and unwrap. So uh, I'm gonna have a V2 that comes out of this, and I'm going to have like unit vector or octahedral from unit vector, uh, something like that. And then I'm gonna have a V3, which is like unit vector from octahedral. And these will just be my functions uh, that transform in and out, right? Uh, and I guess we'll call this V and this O or something, right? And so we know we're gonna compute something like this. And let's go through the steps. So we know that if we want to compute an octahedral mapping from a direction vector, we know that we need to start by taking the absolute value. Um, so we're gonna need the absolute value of the three components of this thing. Uh, in order, because remember we start by taking the one norm. 
right? So we need to take the one norm of this thing. That goes down here. Uh, so now we know its magnitude. And again, this is so we can transform it from a sphere, which is obviously going to, it's going to have that, that signature bowing out that a sphere has, right? It's, it's got the sine cosine curve baked in there. We're taking that out, right? So we start with the one norm. We've computed the one norm. Now we need to figure out what the XY planar projection would be. So getting rid of the Z. So if we take the V XY here and we take the reciprocal of the one norm. So this, right? So if we invert the one norm and then we use that as a coefficient to multiply the XY, uh, the actual planar version of this octahedron, that's going to get us back the actual result, right? That's our actual octahedral mapping right there. But we now need to take care of the bottom half of the sphere. So this would take a, uh, the hemispherical map and we'd just be done. But in the case where the Z is less than zero, now we have to compute a version of this thing that blows out those under the underside of the sphere out into the unfolded part of the octahedral map. So to do that, we need to start by saying, well, okay, if V is less than zero, then we're in that case. If we're not, then just don't do it, right? So this is complete if we were on the top half of the sphere, the Z positive half of the sphere. Ooh, that's tart. There's a lemon juice. Anyway. Um, so we get that and we want to say, all right, let's take the, uh, let's take the unfolding that we already have, which is this, and let's push it out into the corners. Now, if you remember the way that we did this, what we effectively said is, look, let's take the absolute value of these. And I don't know, I don't think we have an absolute value for a vector, do we? Because we don't really have that. And maybe we should. So I don't know. Like, let's say maybe we do want this because, hey, it's probably a thing. Right? Uh, so what we want to do here is say, let's take the absolute value of this thing. Um, and that just allows us to do this a little bit more flexibly, I suppose, right? And yeah, that looks right, right? Just take the absolute value of the two components and pop back the result. So we know we've got the absolute value here and we want to uh, take the absolute value of whatever the result was. The problem that we're going to have is we need to swap these, right? Because remember, in addition to taking the absolute value, um, you know, we want to do this. And maybe, you know what, maybe this was premature. Maybe we don't actually need this. Because I think we're, we're going to have to swap these. I'm going to write this in scalar. Because we need to swap them and we need to subtract them from one. And this isn't a shader, so we don't have all of the conveniences of a shader at the moment. Like we don't have the swizzle ability and so on. So, in here we've got result x. What we're actually going to want to do is subtract the absolute value of result y. And again, that's because we're going the opposite direction. We're coming back from the edge now, but also we're rotating 90 degrees because of the way this thing folded out. And for those of you who were here uh, yesterday already know exactly what I'm talking about, but this is the diagram that we're doing here. So, that first step, I should, should have said this at the beginning, I just assumed everyone was here yesterday, but not everyone would have been. This first step here, right, computing the one norm and taking the result, that's just taking this top half of the sphere and mapping it into a diamond, right? Because we get rid of the Z, so this flattens down, right? 
And then we take the one norm, which turns these bowing bowed arcs here, right? Obviously, bowing is different. A bowed arc is an arc that has a curve on it. A bowing arc is one that goes straight into the ground because they are literally so callous with human life that they didn't even bother to employ any real software engineering practices in their planes. So that's always good. Um, moving on from that particular horrific reality of modern programming and coming back to this, we actually have uh, the other part of the sphere, which is the bottom part here. And that part needs to be unfolded out. And so when we are figuring out how to take this mapping, because remember, after we've done this, the top and the bottom half of the sphere have mapped onto each other. They're both in this diamond. So what we need to do is take each of these quadrants of the diamond and fold it out into the other part so that it won't do that. This part here would be the end of it, right? This, this right here, will take any part, like, so no matter where we were, any one of these, we will now turn ourselves into this top part here, right? But because we've taken the absolute value of each of these, so it doesn't matter where you were in here, we're up here now, and we've subtracted them from one, right? So we've taken this one and turned it into this one, right? We flipped the two coordinates and subtracted them to the one, which mirrors it and puts it up in the corner. But now we need to put it back where it was, right? Now we've got a sign of here, right? And you can see our sign of function doesn't return zero. So it's what we want. Um, so what we need to do is put this thing back in the quadrant where it actually belongs. So we need to take a sign of whatever the result x was and multiply that um, by whatever the uh, flipped version actually is, which sends the thing back down to whatever quadrant it should have actually been in. And I believe that now gives us the complete octahedral mapping that we were looking for uh, in the first place. Now, doing a unit vector from octahedral mapping is the other way round, right? And so what we're going to need to do here is reverse this process. So you can see that we're going to have two branches uh, because we had two branches to begin with, but we don't actually know what those branches should be yet because we haven't looked at what these will actually come out to. Now, I would assume um, that if we were to take these two uh, together, so if I took OX plus OY, right, and I took the absolute value of these two things, I'm just going to try and write this myself. I haven't looked at what the actual code is for it. So let's try to write it ourselves first and then we'll go look at what the actual code is that they gave um, and just to see if we're right. Or if we, you know, we probably will, we might be right, but we might, we probably will be less efficient because they've probably thought about this for longer than we have and worked out the most optimal way of doing it, right? But anyway, if I take my X and my Y, so what can you tell, like what does this triangle have to say about itself or any of these triangles in the interior? Well. What they have to say about themselves is the x plus the y is less than 1, right? Or equal to 1, right? It can't be more than 1 because if it was, it would be in one of the outer triangles. So I posit that our two branches should look like this. Okay? So we've got two branches. One is where the 1 norm is greater than 0. One, oh, sorry where it's greater than one, and one where it is less than one. So in the case where it's less than one, we're inside the diamond, which means we're on the top half of the sphere. So if we're on the top half of the sphere, then I think, actually, all we need to do is reconstruct what we would have done. So in the top half of the sphere, that's this half here, what we're going to want to do is say, well, here's what we did before, right? Here was what our x, y was previously in the top half of the sphere. I don't know what I'm going to call this yet. Uh, but if we had our one norm, we know that this is what we were going to do. So the thing we actually want is this, right? This is, well, you know what this is? This is o.xy is what this is. Here's the thing we actually want, which is result xy, right? And we need to solve these. Well, hey, guess what? Algebra can do that for us, right? The problem is we don't know this actual thing because this includes adding z. So we'll call this one norm plus z, right? This is the one norm without z. So if we wanted to, we could do this, right? Move this over to this side. 
by inverting it. Oops. Right? So instead of dividing by the one norm, now we're just multiplying by the one norm. So if we were to multiply by the one norm plus whatever the z value was, then we would get back what we actually wanted for our x, y here. The problem is we don't know what the z value was, right? Like I have no idea what the z value was because they didn't send it to me, right? But if we actually look at what this was, this was vx, vy, vz. We added these together, and I'm probably going to have to do this out on the, the blackboard, but, uh, and then we divided by them. So actually, we know that we were only missing one value here from the original one norm uh, if we wanted to reconstitute it, right? And now that I think about it, I suppose, so uh, I don't actually know that I really have to do this, to be completely honest with you, because if we know where this was, we should actually be able to just blow it out to a circle. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, point being, I'm going to actually do this out on the, on the blackboard because it's usually better to do the math uh, than not. But you see where I'm going with this, right? I need to reconstruct these values, and it turns out that the only value I don't know is z. I know what the other two values were after the fact. So um, I'm just trying to reconstitute what they would have been. So let me just write these out explicitly, and we'll go from there. Uh, here is my Milton. And if we look at what's actually going to happen here, I guess we'll do unit. Oops. Uh, octahedral. To unit. All right. Uh, so looking at what, we're, what we've got here, we know that we have uh, a vector here which is like vx, vy, vz. And then we know we have an ox and an oy, uh, which we can map between these two. We know the mapping going forwards. We're trying to figure out the mapping going backwards. We know that the relationship between these two things is always that ox equals, because we know this, right? This equation here. Uh, the vx times uh, this one over the one norm, right? So it's going to be one over vx, vy, vz. Oops. Right? So we know that this is the equation for ox, given these. And we know that this is the equation for oy, also given the same thing. Right? So we know we've got these two equations and we can run them forwards, but the problem is now we want to be able to run them backwards. And so if we actually try to solve this, what we would get is we multiply through both sides. And again, we're trying to solve for the Vx and the Vy. We multiply through both sides and we get something for like this equation. We'd have like Ox times Vx plus Ox times Vy plus Ox times Vz equals... Uh, and you can see that that was me just m multiplying that through, equals like Vx, right? And similarly, you'd get the other one too. They'd, oops, they'd be exactly the same. Right? So we know we have two equations here, but the problem is of the things that we actually need to know, we, we don't have this value. Right? So we don't know what the input VZ actually was. So although we've got two equations in two unknowns otherwise, this part we don't actually know. Right? And looking through it, the only information that we will get is whether or not Z was positive or negative. Right? So we, we know like positive or negative Z. But how are we going to solve two equations in three unknowns, right? How, what can we do? 
Well, I assume, the answer here is that we did have one more piece of information. Although it is not written down here, we know right in the statement that when we produce an answer, we are not going to consider any actual answers that don't involve a unit vector. So we expected a unit vector in and we're going to produce a unit vector out, which means that I can write the additional equation of one equals the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared, right? I know this is the answer. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I know this is a constraint because I said so. We're never going to translate anything else into this into um, the octahedral map. And by definition, we couldn't because we're trying to unwrap the surface of a sphere, never the inside or outside of that sphere. So we know that no matter what we do, um, it's always going to look like this, right? And we picked a unit sphere, so it's one, but if we want, we could do it any, with any radius sphere just by changing this number, right? So, what that means is that if we did want to solve these three equations, we now have an additional weapon in our arsenal, which is one, because I can square both sides, equals vs squared, uh, vy squared, plus vz squared. And the only thing that we wouldn't necessarily know here, again, is the signs, because as you can see, all the signs in this will be destroyed, right? Thankfully, we will end up knowing all of the signs. Why? Because we know what quadrant we put the thing in, and we know whether the z was positive or negative based on which branch we're in. So even though we destroy all our signs with our third equation, it doesn't matter because we actually can reconstruct those signs separately, right? So we should be able to just solve this thing thinking everything is positive, right? Just assuming everybody's positive. And then we just place it into the quadrant that we need it to be uh, or octant, I should say, because we know all the signs from other external information that doesn't really relate to actually figuring out what the values are. Okay. So if this is the case, how can we actually go about solving this equation? Like, what can we actually do here uh, to try and, and, and put this together? Well, I guess what I would first start out doing is I would try to solve this equation probably. This is going to be pretty ugly. Uh, but we'll see what happens. So if I wanted to solve for, uh, for example, vz squared, then I would end up with, uh, oops, not square root, uh, then I would end up with one minus vx squared plus vy squared, right? I'm just swapping these out here. Uh, so these two move to their side and I'm positive on this side. So off we go, right? So then I would have VZ equals positive or negative square root of one minus VX squared plus, well, actually that's not right. Yeah. Right. And so if I wanted to plug VZ into these equations up here, I could just do it. It would provide me with these other two, right? And it's a little nasty because that's not really what you want to see as far as plugging something in uh, to both sides. If I'm completely honest about it, it's, it's not great, right? Um, not sure if there's a way to simplify that down. Um, it doesn't really look like there is to me there. Um, I, I don't really see any, any real clever way to do that. Yeah, so I don't know. Um, so anyway, if we assumed that that was what we had to plug in, so one minus ux squared minus vy squared, uh, then if you looked at one of these equations, you would be able to sub in this term, right? Um, so you would be able to basically say like, all right, you know, we've got VX plus VY plus this heinous thing here, and that's going to equal uh, VX on the other side, or you could subtract it over as well. 
although he couldn't pull it out. Um, I'm not sure that really helps us much. It's got to be an easier way to do this that I'm just not thinking of. I mean, here's one thing I'll just mention. So let's suppose that we took the diamond, because I don't really want to chug through that math, to be completely honest with you, because it seems like maybe there should be a simpler way to conceive of it, right? Like, I feel like I'm overcomplicating it. So if we were to assume that we took the diamond here, right? If we were lying flat in the diamond plane, meaning we were on one of these lines, Right, so we knew that if we knew that z was zero, right, then we know that what we would actually be doing is just two normalizing this thing. You know what I'm saying? So we know that all we would have to actually do is say x squared, like you know, our o x squared plus our o y squared is going to equal the um, uh, sorry square rooted, right? Uh, this is going to equal the length of, of, of our vector, and we know that it has to end up equaling 1, right? So we know that in order to produce the final values, our result x, or our vx, is going to be our ox over this term. And our vy, oops, it's a bad v, our vy is going to be oy over term right so for just that slice we would know what to do and the reason that we know that is because we know that like the oy value here is zero right so the real question would be well what would we do once we start to move up from there right so if we needed to be like up further how would we actually determine that? Well, we know that, you know, obviously if th the OX, OY are zero, then we would know that the, I'm sorry, the OZ, uh, we would know that the OZ value would actually be uh, one in that case. Uh, and so we know the other ones would be zero, but what do we do as we kind of smoothly go up and down in there? Well, I mean, one way to think about it would be when we did this mapping, we could imagine doing the whole mapping right? So if we said vx, vy, vz goes to ox, oy, and we said this, right? If we then had an oz value, which was vz times 1 over vx plus vy plus vz, right? That would be the complete mapping, and then we would know exactly what to do. So if we had ox, oy, and oz, then all we would have to do is reverse the process, right? So we would just say like, oh, okay, if this was the normalization before, we just multiply each one by whatever this is and, and we're done, right? So, you know, we previously did this, so we just need to multiply each value by this to get the, to get the thing back, right? Um, Uh, and furthermore, I guess you would never actually need that because if you know you're always producing a unit vector, then you know that these things have the right length. And so actually, if you had OZ, right, you would just be doing this. You would just say uh, OX squared plus OY squared plus OZ squared, right? Square rooted equals your length value, and then your VX equals the ox over the length, your vy equals the oy over the length, and your vz equals the oz over the length, right? So if you look at how this would have to work, you'd go like, okay, well, 
if I think about this process here and look at the computation of the length, again, this is the part that I don't actually know. And the OX squared plus the OY squared, I know they originally summed to one, right? So before I did the divide by the value that I don't actually know, I know they originally summed to one. Oh, but, wait, but I specified that they summed to one. Okay, I'm an idiot. I don't even know why I had to think about that. So, after all that, yeah, so I basically specified that these had to sum to one. Because I divided by the, by the norm. I'm an idiot. So, OZ is always equal to one minus OX plus OY. I mean, that's the definition of the one norm, right? That's, wow, all right. Talk about spending a lot of time to figure out something you should have known immediately. Can you tell I haven't done 3D programming in a while? Yeah, kind of obvious at this point. So that's actually trivial. So OZ we know, right? Uh, and basically like OZ is just one minus the sum of these two, right? Um, because we know that they had to sum up to whatever the part, we know that the X and the Y summed up to one when you included OZ, whatever the heck OZ was, right? Um, so you know that they would have summed up to one after the divide because this divide ensured that they did. Know what I'm saying? So once we know what OZ is, then we know what all three values were, which means we can produce the unit vector trivially, right? So the only thing I'm not sure about is how to do the unquadranting of it. I'll have to think about that for a second. But basically OZ, is, this is, that's, that's OZ, right? Oh, and, and I guess we also know that. So yeah, 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 yeah. So we sum the xy, we know if the xy is greater than one, then we know that oz is actually negative, right? So we know that oz equals negative oz. Otherwise it's positive. And then that's it, right? I mean, I think we're done. We just say the result is ox, oy, oz, and We normalize it, right? Um, I don't know why that took me so long. I forgot about the constraint that they were gonna have to add to one after the one norm, but I think that's correct. So we take the X and the Y, we add them together. At that point, we know that since the first thing we did before we did anything else back here is we know the result is always gonna have to sum to one because we one normalized it first. So we know to construct Z, to reconstruct Z after the fact, we know that the magnitude of OZ is always just whatever would have made these two sum to one because that's exactly what we did before, right? So then we just check, all right, is it greater than one? If it, uh, the sum of the two, if it was, we're in one of the unfolding quadrants. So that means Z was negative. If it wasn't, it means Z was positive. So we leave it exactly as it was, right? At the end of the day, we then have a vector. We know that that vector has all of the correct components in it. We just don't know whether or not it needs, like what direction, uh, sorry. We know that it has the right sign and the right magnitude. So then we just have to normalize it out to the unit sphere, right? Now, the only thing I'm not sure about is because of the unfolding, there's that one minus. So this part here, uh, I'm not sure how to reconstruct that. But I guess we know which one it is. So, and I guess, I, you know what I should do here? I should do this. Let's do that. 
Uh, so now I think about it, no, we actually know that as well. Because when we're in the sum xy phase here, we know now where we were. So if we did unfold, we unfolded in this branch. So we can actually just undo this, right? So we know that what we would have done inside this branch is ox and oy would have gone through this process. We can just reverse the solve uh, and do the opposite operation. So previously what we had done is we had said, let's take the absolute value instructed from one. So now what we can do is just do the opposite of that. So take and flip it, right? We can, we can do exactly the same. Like this, this is literally the same thing. Right, um, because we're, we just literally want to do the flip again. We just want to, we just want to undo this 1.0 flip here. That's that's all we're really trying to do. Uh, and so we can literally do the exact same thing again to flip to do to undo the flip that we did, and then we do the exact same thing. Now we have the swizzle again, so we want to unswizzle, which is that right. Sign of the results, one minus the results. And in this case, we've got the absolute value of the thing that we stored, and we want to multiply it by the sign of that thing because it comes back in as that sign, right? So I think it looks like that. So I think that's where we're at. All right, let's see how close we got. Um, do they have an implementation here? I don't know if they do. Um, so uh, here is something that goes to the octahedral mapping. And if we look at, at that, uh, it, you can see that it, it does exactly what we do on the first step. So that's here. It's doing these two together, um, which is fine. You don't need it again, so you can totally do that. And then it just does uh, yeah, it does, it does exactly the same thing we do. So I think that's all correct. Uh, and then for the octa float version, which is going the other way around, the first thing it does is it says, let's create a vector that's with the x, y, and the one minus the two abs is, um, and that's exactly what we do. Yep. So that, that's exactly what we just did here. And then it says, if it's less than zero, it does this. Otherwise, it returns the normalized, or well, it always returns the normalized version, so that's exactly what we do. Uh, and so the only question is, does this do the same thing? Let's see if it does. So in their branch, which is here, they do this. That's the xy equals one minus the abs of the yx. That's exactly what we're doing here, times the sine of the xy. So no, they don't flip the, hmm. So they've got that. Right. And that was what I was agonizing about at the end there. And so why is that the case though? Because the flip, oh, okay, 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 no, I, I see what that's the case. That's the case because we're trying to leave the thing in the same quadrant as it was. And so we don't actually want, when we do that flip, that's just a 90 degree rotation, but it, we don't want to change the quadrant. So, okay, I do, I believe that. So we almost got it, but no, we were slightly wrong there with the flip. And I should have known that because, hey, you have to invert the function. It's going to have to flip and maintain the sign the same way that it did in the input. So I suppose that makes sense, but. All right. That seems fair. Uh, I'm totally fine with that. I don't know if that compiles. If we got errors in there, let's take a look. Looks like looks like we're good. Um, so now we have a way of doing our octahedral mapping for any particular direction. And we can also unmap it if we need to. I don't know that we're actually going to need this, but for completeness sake, I wanted to put in the full mapping in and out uh, because, I don't know, maybe we want that. I'm not sure. At the very least, we'll have to use this in the shader. So, you know, there's that. 
so let's go ahead and take a look at how we're actually encoding these things uh, and sending them down. So if we take a look at the um, lightning code here, let's go ahead and switch to one of our test functions uh, because we have a lot of different stuff here. Uh, look, we've got test cast from probes, right? And then we've got the voxel output nonsense here and all that, right? And so what we're going to have to do now is to start to think about these in a way that actually allows us to output them uh, a little more sanely. And I guess what we could do here is just keep the way that we're storing them at the moment. And, you know, I, again, I don't really know that we want these to be stored the way that they're stored, but I'm going to sort of ignore that part of things for a little while. So what I'm going to do instead is say, all right, we are storing light voxel cells here, which have to have a bunch of information in them. I'm going to say that we're just going to store this stuff as actual little kernels of information here. So in our light color, where we're storing that, I'm going to actually say, look, let's put that in the light color lookup square dim. Let's just do that, right? So here's the little square. Uh, and the same will be true of the D, so the depth value, right? So for each voxel cell, I'm just going to store this explicitly in the cell for now. I don't think this is going to be probably the way we want to do it in the end, but I want the most straightforward thing so that we don't really have uh, any ambiguity here, right? Like I don't want there to be any nonsense. Uh, so yeah, so we'll start with that and we'll deal with later what this is actually going to do. Now, when we're accumulating into these things, um, I feel like the accumulation can happen at the end using the data that's in the transfer buffer. So I'm going to go ahead and say that these can just be probably, uh, well... Time stretch. Uh, hmm. I guess it, for the interest of, of simplicity for now, I, I guess I, I, that's not what I'm going to say. So let's do it this way. Right. So we can do our accumulation separately. I, I just don't know if that makes much sense uh, in the long run. Um, I think that's just dumb. So, you know, we'll, we'll, We'll smarten that up later, but for now we can just, you know, we'll we'll do the fully expanded thing just so we can isolate errors a little bit better. So that's going to be our voxel cells, and when we put stuff in there, we'll we'll put them in based on the octahedral mapping. All right. Uh, let's see here. So we've got some trilinear interpolation stuff happening. You can see the trialer here is grabbing uh, out of whichever field uh, we're looking for and all that garbage. So we can still do that. The only difference now is that the field parameter has to actually have a more interesting uh, piece of information with it. And so when we're doing compute radiance here, we're going to have to actually do a smarter sum, right? So this is not what we actually want. Um, we're gonna have to, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna if this out for now, right? Because uh, we're gonna wanna do something different there. But for now, we'll just say we get back nothing. And what we actually wanna do here is we're gonna actually, we're gonna wanna sample the particular direction that we're looking in. So this is really just gonna be a sample by uh, when we actually need to do this compute voxel irradiance, we're just going to need to actually produce a sample there, right? Like, um, so take the direction, figure out, you know, do octahedral from unit vector, uh, and then get the actual particular X and Y out that we want to in, uh, index. And that's what we would do in the end. So it's actually not going to be very hard. Uh, we'll, and, and there will only be... Right, it'll look like this. Uh, 
right? Well, we'll take an octahedral, we'll convert it to like a texel or a table, something like that, by just multiplying it by the total number of pixels that there are, right? So it'll be really simple for us to do, actually, at the end of the day. Uh, we will know exactly what we're looking at uh, there, and, and it'll be fine. But when we actually do our getter radiance value, uh, we're not gonna, we're, we're probably gonna need to have this be a little smoother. So what we might have to do here is actually take a trilinear filter of bilinear filters, right? Because we wanna, when we actually do that sample, we wanna actually get those. So this part will actually maybe turn into a bilinear sample, but we won't have to call this four times, right? It'll just be once with one value and that's all we would actually need. Uh, so anyway, anyway. All right, so in here where we're doing our accumulation, again, not a thing. So we kind of need this to, you know, this stuff will have to be sort of written in a little bit more, uh, a little bit later on. And uh, yeah, so all of this stuff, yeah, still not, not really gonna work yet. So these all have to be kind of stubbed. Yep. All right, so I think we're now at the actual place we care about. So we don't want to do these tests. What we want to do is just test the light sphere uh, first. And so let's go ahead and do that. Or maybe we want to take a test a checkerboard first. We probably want to do both, honestly. Um, but we'll take a look. So when we look at how these are going to be written to, this is not probably what we want anymore, would be my guess. Uh, probably what we want to do is just write directly to the uh, voxel in question, um, because now we need to kind of think about which one we're actually writing to, right? Uh, so, and you know, I guess the other way to look at it would be if this is, if this is actually the test version of it, uh, then maybe what we would want to do is, uh, Where are these getting copied out though? Okay, so this is writing directly into the bitmap as well. So that's fine. All right. So if we're gonna go through all of these, I think what we then wanna do is actually have uh, where we write out, we're gonna wanna write the individual values that we have. Like, so we're gonna wanna um, loop through the, the two dimensional octahedral unwrapped block, right? So what we're gonna wanna do here is have a thing where we write out for each direction, like we're gonna want to do sort of our, our uh, TX uh, and our TY. Uh, and these are going to be wrapping the whole thing, right? As ugly as that, as that is. Right? Uh, yeah. So for each of these, we're going to need to output a light color and a light depth. And... If I start them off like so, uh, then we just need to actually have like our test light sphere do something, right? And so the first thing presumably we would do is say, all right, we needed to get a unit vector from whatever the octahedral sample actually is in this case. And we're not gonna worry about the gutter right now. So we'll sort of start by doing this without the gutter and then we'll, we'll work out the gutter part separately. So the actual O vector here, so like the OXY vector, um, we know that it's the TX and the TY, but they actually have to be normalized out, right? 
So we have to take TX and divide it by light color lookup square dim. Um, minus one. And we need uh, our TY to be light color lookup square dim minus one. Oops. Uh, and then we've got our sort of, in, uh, that's our input. So it's normalized zero to one inside the octahedron. And we now need to convert that out to a direction, right? So this is the light dir, if, I, if like this is, or this is the um, sample dir. So this is which direction we're looking. So the OXY goes in, the sample direction comes out. Uh, and then we need to like figure out what the heck we're doing uh, with the sphere here. So you can see we're trying to compute some other stuff about where we are in voxel space. That's all fine. So then we have to look and say, all right, uh, what is all this about? Like, what's the intensity of the light in this direction? Um, you know, what, what would we see from the light source if we were po pointing in, in this direction and so on? And I guess what we would say is if we know this stuff, like we've got uh, how far away it is and all that, I don't know. This is multiple lights, and I guess I don't really want that at the moment. So let's, let's delete some of this stuff here. All right. So we just want to say what the color of the light would be at this point. I don't know why we've got an extra, I don't know why there's an extra one of these. There shouldn't be. I think that's right, right? Yeah. Uh, so for each of these directions, we need to put something in here for the light. And I guess this is a little bit tough for us to know what this should be because we don't really know like what, we don't really know what we're talking about here because it's it's light that's coming from all directions and we're you know it's hard to translate a point light into that environment because it's not really what that means um so i guess what we could do is let's pretend that we just have a directional light because that would actually work okay so if we wanted a directional light or or um or i guess what we could do is a point light with a with a size right we could sort of say, look, would, how close are you to pointing to this thing? And we'll just fall off from there. So if we said, all right, the direction to the light from where we are is like the light UVW minus the Vox UVW, right? And the light UVW is, is up here, right? So wherever the light is, we know this points towards the light. We know this is how far we are from the light. We can do the fall off exactly as we would have done before. Um, and then we can kind of just stuff this thing in there for the light color. That all would work, but now we need to also take into account uh, the clamped zero to one inner product between the direction we're pointing and the direction we're sampling, right? So we just need to say, look, whatever the light normal was, we want to dot that with whatever our sample direction was and fall off from there. So the actual light A, right, in this case, uh, is going to multiply by this clamped version here uh, so that we can get, you know, what we would have expected. Um, once we get the light color, I don't really want it ranging from negative one to one per se anymore. It should just be zero to one. Uh, so this part is kind of wrong. And this is, uh, yeah, just not what we actually want. Um, so what we probably should say is like clamp zero one here of the light C. So something like that is more or less what we want. And uh, uh, so the light color would just be, you know, whatever the actual light color would be. So maybe that for now, but times this information, right? All right, our light depth we don't fill in here, so we'll just leave that as you know some other large value. I don't know what it should be. Um, something like this, I guess. Uh, and we'll kind of cross that bridge when we come to it. Uh, 
uh, because we will need this somewhere. So I don't know how many units the maximum travel should be, but you know, I don't know. Let's say it's 128 for no real reason. Um, and then we'll just say max light depth. So that'll fill out our table. And um, what is the complaint? Hides a previous definition. What is the previous definition? Oh, it's this definition. All right. So we're going to make that light C and light D then because, oh well. And this is light color. So what we probably want to look at here is now, okay, are those things actually getting output anywhere? Because I don't think they are, right? So at some point, we then have to actually write this data out. And, and we're not doing that. Right, like I don't, I don't see that happening anywhere. Yeah, so you know, you look at what's happening here. These need to actually be written somewhere. They need to be written into the voxel somewhere. Um, and I guess I'm not. I'm not sure when we would have wanted to do that. It seems like you would have wanted to do it right here, but for some reason we're not. Where is this where is this at? Hmm. So, I guess I don't understand what's going on here. Uh because looking at producing these values, I don't really under, like, what was this for? Is this just like, because we had like old code that was sitting around here? Because if we're doing this in the hot dimension here, right? Then what we should be able to do is each time we come through here, we should then be able to write this thing back, but no one is actually writing it back. You can see that here it would have been writing it back, but like what, so what was going on here? Or did these just directly write before? Cause they don't now. So I'm not sure I really understand why what's going on with that um i guess we just accidentally deleted the code that would have done that here but uh, again this is the code that would have done that you can see it writing it out here right like um this is the part that would have actually done that piece of work so i'm super confused it looks like this is old news or maybe i accidentally deleted something important there but point being like this is what we would actually want right So in here, we would actually want to put, uh, you know, we'd want to put this this here. Uh, so we would want like our our uh, light data C and our light data D. Uh, you know, we would we would be doing this right, and so we would need to be able to to index out into those in a way that made sense here. And so I, I don't really know exactly what's going on there. Um, that's pretty confusing. But anyway, you know, it would look something like this. So that would write it into the texture. Now, the problem is we don't know what this value actually is. Like, yes, this is using the dimensions of the hot corner part properly in theory to locate us in the actual texture. But the problem is this doesn't take into account the actual size of the actual image of each like footprint, right? So what we actually need to do here is say, all right, we are indexing into this thing by every time we take a step in X, it's actually X times the, uh, times the like oct dim, right? Whatever the octahedral dimension is. So we, every time we take a step in X, we're going one oct dim over, right? Every time we take a step in Y, it's actually hot dim, you know, times oct dim, right? Because we have to go that many X's. And every time we take a step in Z, we need to take a step times, uh, uh, times the oct dim squared because we're actually taking, you know, a step in both of those 
the two, the, bo both things, right? It's, it's taking a step in this total bit here, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. I think that's right. So I think that's what we would actually do. And the octodim, of course, in this case, is not actually pulled out from... Um, so if you look at the hot dim, it comes out of here, but it, we actually know this, and I don't know. It actually looks like this, right? Um, and in theory, that's how we would actually write out the pixels, right? That's where they go. And we don't really want to do that long term because it's pretty bad the way we're doing that. Um, but, you know, this is just getting things working. So this is the, uh, we, we have two of these, right? One is the uh, one for the color and one's for the depth. And the only difference between them is whose, you know, octim you used. And I think that's it. And then we just need to, yeah. At this point, we probably want to clean this code up a little bit. I'm not really sure what the game render commands actually called this thing. <clears throat> So light voxel C and light voxel D. So I think that's all we need. This is just, I don't know what we want to actually compute here. I guess this is just A. So, so this is the A, the A, uh, and the A again. And I think that's all. All right, so that doesn't really help us because, you know, we don't really have time to do anything with it. Um, so, you know, we're writing out those values, but, you know, we don't, they're not actually doing anything anyways. And uh, we don't have an idea of what that even looks like at the moment. Now, I could actually try to throw the lighting in there real quick, but I don't really want to because we need to actually sit down and do the rest of it now. So we'll just probably leave it at that for today. Uh, what I would say is let's take a, just as a, Final thing at the end of the uh, of the process here. Um, let's just go ahead and try to open our handmade render launch. Uh, so let's just see if we can't take a quick capture of a frame and validate that we actually even are sending anything and that they are actually at least somewhat the right dimensions or something, right? So if we take a look at one of these color passes here, um, you can see some draw elements calls building these things up. Uh, in theory, there should be an actual texture that goes along with that. And if we look at the texture viewer, uh, I guess, I'm not sure, I'm not really, we've mostly been using Insight, so I'm not super facile with RenderDoc, but we should be able to go look and see what textures were actually being um, sampled here or could have been sampled. Um, I don't know where to get that information, unfortunately. Um, hmm. So where's the bound textures? Does that, do we know where that would be? Maybe I'll save this for next time. Cause I, like I said, I never use render doc. We, we used Insight most of the time. So um, I don't even know how we're picking a texture here. Like, is there a texture list somewhere? There we go. Ah, ha, ha, there it is. Found it. Um, so there should be a dimension listed here. So here's some dimensions listed here, right? And looking at this, that, uh, I don't know why that's a checkerboard. Oh, I guess because it's this thing here. 
Um, so looking at looking at these, you can see like the various ones we have here, and it looks like those are probably the ones. Where's our texture atlas? Or our texture array. I don't know where our texture array is. It should be here somewhere. So there's a one by one by one. That's not, that's like our null texture or whatever. Um, there it is. So here's all our sprites, right? And I don't, I don't know how you flip through those. Um, here we go. So here's our, like, there's our, texture atlas, right? So that's our null texture. Here's our texture atlas. This presumably is our lighting data. And I'll be honest, that's not very good. Like there's nothing in there, which seems bad because we should have written something, right? Uh, and there's our depth. Somehow our depth actually has information in it, which makes no sense because it shouldn't, but it apparently does. So there's that, right? Uh, how did that happen? Oh, because we are writing max, le max light depth, but we should have written it everywhere and we very clearly don't. Oh, uh, I know why that is as well. So in addition here where we do our slices, we also have to do, uh, our our offset by our xy so our tx has to be in here obviously and our ty has to be in here as well and the ty has to move down by you know the x oct dim oops let me put that on the next line <laughs> to unpack into the texture atlas properly we need to do a um I split this poorly. Okay. Right, I need to actually develop some addressing for this. So the Y here in this case, the TX will just step one at a time, uh, but the TY is going to have to step down a row at a time, right? And in this particular case, I guess I don't know how we were planning to store these because we never really talked about it, but I'm assuming that we would want to store them in actual rows, in actual 2D rows. What that means is that instead of a separate TY there, we kind of just want, um, we want to multiply that by the hot dim times the oxy dim itself, right? Because we need to move down an entire row. Uh, at a time, right? So this Y here is actually this. Because for each Y, we need to move down an entire C dim's worth of rows. So it would actually look like this. We're gonna have to systematize this because that's pretty ugly, right? But that's that's what we actually have to do. And uh, so there we go. Uh, but right, so that would actually be the summation there. I don't know why our light C values are coming out as zero all the time. Um, whereas our light D values are actually writing in properly. So I guess like this is not working right, uh, apparently. So we'll have to take a look at what's happening there because we should at least get something sometimes, right? For this stuff. Um, so we'll have to look at what's actually going in there a little bit later. Uh, but let me just double check that this in fact writes, we wanna be able to write, um, to, wait a minute, how do I stop the capture? Did I already stop the capture? Um, close capture, I guess. 
again, my non-familiarity with RenderDoc is a little bit rough here. Um, so anyway, yeah, if we wanted to just, just verify for our own purposes that we were getting anything out there, um, it looks like the red values were getting written for us, but uh, I don't know about anybody else. So if I actually come through here, oops, that's not what I wanted. If I actually launch this, this fellow uh, and do a print screen and then close, Now what I should be able to do is take a look at that texture that was read before, uh, which is this one. Oh, there's some stuff in there, uh, which is read before. And it should be all red, which it is. And that doesn't really mean it's right. It just means we are at least writing to the whole thing, which is what we wanted. And uh, looking at this one, we actually get some stuff in here, but it looks wrong. So it's probably not quite right. Um, it's probably almost right, but our indexing might be slightly off. Uh, just looking at what's going on here, or our octahedral stuff could also be buggy, right? Um, yeah, so I don't know uh, what to make of that exactly, but it's not the worst thing that we've ever made. Uh, so I think it puts us in position to, to get going next weekend. All right, I'm happy to go to a brief Q&A now. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, you're right. I did do that. Where's the... Let me switch back here. You're right. So this one we can't quite do because we need it. So um, I guess in this case, I can just do that. Right, because we don't actually change these values. So I can just do them this way, I suppose. Right? I think the OZ doesn't need to be negated in the unit vector from octahedral function. Um, I think you're wrong. I think it does need to be negated, right? Um, you know what I'm saying to you? So if, if you look at what's happening, uh, and, and yeah, and here we probably want to do the same thing, right? So I'm not sure how we write that cleanly. So if I, uh, hmm. So I'm not really sure what we would do there. So I guess what we would do is say, all right, um, yeah, because it, it, this one's nice because we already sort of made it out into more variables, so it's easy for us to make this work without worrying about the overwrite, right? Um, someone who took my name, does it always have to be positive? No, so we're trying to produce a unit vector, right? So Z has to be pointing in the correct direction. So I'm pretty sure we always have to check, were we on the bottom of the sphere? If we are, we have to negate Z. Because Z, this is always gonna be plus. This is always going to give us positive Z, but Z points down sometimes, right? Um, <clears throat> so yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure we need this line. As to how to rewrite this one, so uh, what's the cleanest way to do this? Boy, th that makes that vector notation so much nicer when you think about it because you don't have this problem in there. Um, it'd be nice if we could do that, but we can't really. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, I guess we just have to compute them as temps. 
Whoa, what just happened? That was weird. All right. You know, we, we could do this. You know? Um, I guess. If one minus some x y is less than zero, no, but but it's not. It's it's whether it's less than one, not zero. Right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, hmm. Yeah. All right. No, that's a good point. It would already turn negative. All right, no, all right, I believe you, I believe you. Yeah, because if if these were greater than one, then this will be negative anyway, so we don't have to negate it because it will have negated itself. Yeah, I buy that. Uh, yeah, so the reference code does use sign of not zero, but that's actually the same for us. So if you look at sign of for us, we actually do, ours is a sign of not zero. That's how we defined our sign of. I guess in their land, sign of would return zero if it was equal to zero. Ours already returns positive. Um, so we kind of already did that. Uh, which makes us not quite be nomenclature compatible, but that's okay. I mean, you're never going to be exactly. But let me let me double check this here. I think I have a typo in the trilerp code. Uh, so what trilerp code though? Um, we don't have any of that at the moment, right? It's returning positive for zero. Yeah, we that's what we do. But it wouldn't really matter. You could you could return either one you wanted, but we return positive for zero as well. Why would we need it to I don't think that's true. Why would we need it to return zero for zero? Actually, no, I disagree. I think it I think it actually can't return zero for zero. If it returns zero for zero, I think it would be a bug, actually. Are you sure their code returns zero for zero? Because that actually doesn't seem necessary in this case at all, right? Yeah, no, their code does not do that. Their code very specifically does not return zero, ever. Right, it is. it does not do that and neither does ours, right? So it can only return positive one or negative one, right? Just like ours. Uh, and like I said, I think that's crucial. I don't think this routine, were, if this returns zero, I think this routine would stop working. Because if you're, you want to retain the value, even in the case where it's zero, because you're actually swizzling, right? So you're, you know what I'm saying? Like you're actually, um, so like in this case, you, you're using the sine of X, but the magnitude of Y. And so if X happens to be zero, um, you don't want to ruin your Y computation because you don't know that y is one because remember z is in the mix so if x is zero y might not be one like it, it doesn't have to be because z could have been it could have been on the y z slice so x can be zero and y can still be any value between zero and one between negative one and one so I think this actually very specifically, there's a reason they called this sign not zero is because they can't actually return. It's not the regular sign function. The regular sign function, I think, returns zero for zero. I think. 
maybe not, but they at least know that's not okay. Like they need to know what the actual sign would have been um, quadrant wise. And you can pick plus or minus depending on z at zero. Like this could go the opposite way. This could be a greater than instead of greater than or equal to. And I think the routine would just, would still just work fine. But what you can't do is ever actually return zero there. Cause that knocks out the equation and you would, you would miss the ring. Uh, so, so let me, uh, let me take a look at the, um, the, 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 you were talking about the TXTY thing though, uh, as a separate issue. So let me just, just take a look at that. Oh yeah, this one. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not actually going to use this though. Uh, so ign ignore that, that that's, you know, we're, we're going to have to rewrite that little part, uh, but it's going to look something like that. Right. All right, folks wanted a uh, recap uh, on RenderDoc just to see if the shrizzle changed things much. We can totally do that. Uh, but we probably have had other problems, right? We just kind of hacked that in there really quickly. We haven't tested anything yet. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think we got a, a ways to go because there's a lot of moving parts in here. Um, Uh, so here it is. Um, I don't know that that looks like it might still have some errors in it. It's, it's better than it was though. Uh, but I'm not sure. Right. We'll see. We're not far. I mean, we're, we're, we're we just got to streamline this, right? So it'll be fine. Is OXY supposed to be mapped between zero and negative zero and one or negative one and one in the light setup code? Oh yeah, you know what? So actually that's a good point. So uh, I believe this hmm. I believe this generally wants to map between negative one and one. So this maps between negative one and one. And so I assume what we actually want to do here when we're doing the, the actual fill, uh, we probably want to actually make that, before we forget, uh, map this between zero and one first, because when we actually do the TXTY, uh, this code here, um, this right here probably need is going to need to map this to negative one to one. So once we actually do the mapping from zero to one, we need to do this. Right. Good catch there. Cause we, it's not, it's not mapped the right way around. Right. Uh, because it, 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 the TXTY is talking about pixels in a grid and it starts at zero. And so we want to actually change that into the unit square, uh, which we need to do differently, right? So uh, again, that, that'll affect the unwrapping. Um, so there's our, where we're going to leave it. Right. And, uh, you know, kind of looks like some lighting sort of, I mean, I could believe that that was storing some lighting. Couldn't you? Um, I wouldn't want to bet on it, but it's looks okay. Like I said, I think it's a reasonable starting point. We got a lot of debugging to do and we're going to want to clean that stuff up and, and all that. So it's, it's, you know, we've got a, we got some work to do, but I don't think we're in bad shape, right? We've got the basics started. So I think we're okay.
If it's okay to ask something off topic, why aren't more engines using dynamic.dll.so for hot deployment of game code? I think they are. I mean, isn't that what Unreal does? I don't think that's unusual. I think lots of engines do it. Do you find it annoying to keep hopping between editor and debugger when you're programming in your ideal environment? Would these two tools be unified in the same window? Um, I guess I don't really know. They probably wouldn't be in the same window because I want my debugger on my second monitor normally and I want my editor on my main monitor. So like the main monitor runs my editor in the game and like a secondary monitor runs the debugger. So probably all I really want is the ability to synchronize the view between the two. And we've kind of talked about this before. I talked with George about this and I think it's not that hard to do that, right? But what I really just want is my editor and my debugger to stay in sync. I don't really want them to necessarily be the same application for any particular reason. And I definitely don't want them to be the same display. It's a special case of Handmade Hero that it looks like this. Normally, I would not have my debugger on the same monitor. Could be a good idea to add to the debug system a way to look at the open gel texture. We could switch less from the game. Well, no, I, I don't know if you remember, but I specifically said that's exactly what we're going to do. So we haven't gotten there yet, but we're definitely doing that. Don't you think using a CPP file instead of a batch file for build setup and configuration would be better since batch files are so bad? Um, who builds the C file? Right? At the minimum, you need a batch file to build the C file that then does the build. So sure, you could go that route, but you still need build.bat. You can never get rid of build.bat. Unreal only does it fairly recently using an external tool, which costs the most zero implementation effort. Um, yeah, like, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't know why anyone does what they do. I have no idea. It's easy to reload code, but I mean, one thing you have to remember is when you go into giant C++ nonsense land, reloading code becomes very difficult because you've got all these function pointers strewn throughout all your code, sitting in dynamic tables all over the place, and you've done 50 million calls to new and you have no idea what they allocated. Um, so like... The fact that we program sensibly on Handmade Hero is one of the things that made it so easy to do. And so I guess what I would say as, is sometimes the reason people can't do this is because they make a lot of really bad decisions and use a lot of stupid modern C++ features that suck. So you can make it a lot harder on yourself by using virtual functions, for example. All right. Thank you everyone for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow the series at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with the source code. Um, I will be back here next week when we will do some work streamlining that process and trying to get our uh, lighting up and running uh, using just a simple sphere light like we were doing before just so we can test that Atlas packing scheme and see if we can you know, kind of iron out all the rough edges and, and get everything debugged. Uh, that's it for this week. Until next week, have fun programming, and I will see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.